contest. Tomorrow's guest speaker, Manabama, I haven't met, but uh, I'm sure you'll tell us somewhat of, of yourself and what your whole mission in life is and what God is doing in your heart personally and in your work. So God bless you as you come forward. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, we're excited to be here this morning. My name is Minna, and uh, well, my name's not up there anymore. But the, what the E is correct. If you look in the bulletin, it has the A, but the E is correct. It's just like Minnesota. All right. If you can say the state of Minnesota, you can say my name. But no, my middle name is not Soda. <laughs> uh, it's just Minna. Uh, I was born in uh, the Netherlands, and so I have a Dutch name. So that's a little bit uh, different than what we're, we're used to probably here. Uh, this, I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay. this is my wife, and uh, this is a, a picture of our two children. You've seen that they were sitting up with us. Uh, they're the blonde ones. We have a friend with us today who we picked up in Brantford. Uh, he's got brown hair. Our two sons are both blonde hair, and they have glasses. Now, this is a picture from 2009 as we were preparing to leave for Portugal. So our children, yes, are much bigger now than they were in this photo. And uh, so you can see that. And uh, so that was us preparing for the mission field. Uh, and this, of course, is what we're doing now. I don't think you really introduced me. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife, Michelle. OK. <laughs> That's correct. Yes. If I look a little bit familiar, I am Rose Cooper's oldest star. Uh, so I do see some familiar faces out there. Pastor Klein was my very first pastor uh, when I was a little baby, <laughs> uh, four years old. Uh, so we do have some uh, connections in court. Uh, we're excited to be here today and uh, just to be able to sh uh, share with you some of our experiences uh, from the first term of our mission work in Portugal. Uh, we left well, almost four years ago now, and uh, we went with the goal of church planting through disciple making community and in the classroom. Uh, whether it's playing sports, uh, having fun with friends, touring castles, or Michelle's favorite, walking along the beach. Uh, you can tell by the smiles on our faces that we enjoyed our ministry in Portugal. We also love ministering in the classroom at Greater Lisbon Christian Academy. I'm going to say GLCA from now on because it's just a lot easier to say. Uh, we are teachers. Uh, we served in Brantford and then before that uh, in the state of North Carolina. And uh, so we went to Portugal um, to spend a good chunk of time in the classroom of GLCA. Uh, GLCA is an international Christian school. Uh, we have students from 11 different countries that kind of fall into three or four groups. We have missionary kids, like our own children. Uh, from ABWE, uh, and also missionary kids from other missions that are working in Portugal. We have some Portuguese um, kids that um, uh, have been introduced to our school through one of our church plants. And then uh, the, probably the biggest group, or the, the group that I'm most excited about, not that I'm not excited about teaching my own children, but it's the international kids. These are kids from all around the world, and uh, their parents and themselves are mostly unchurched. Some of them have not, they've never even opened a Bible in their lives. And if their parents want them in uh, GLCA because of the English education, uh, so it just opens a great door of uh, uh, opportunities for us uh, to be able to teach and mentor these kids. And uh, as we guide them, uh, we have a lot of laughs in the classroom and an awful lot of grammar mistakes because for most of these international kids, English is not their first language. And it truly gives us an abundance of joy. Uh, our ministry motto, uh, which is worship, uh, grow, and serve, you can see that in the bottom left hand corner, is a great way to kind of outline our ministry in Portugal. We're privileged to be able to worship at Cadeja Petition de Linda Velha. Uh, Linda Velha Church celebrated its 31st anniversary just this past March. It was one of the 
very first um, church plants with DPW uh, meeting across borders for world evangelism. Our pastor uh, is a Portuguese man, Carlos Martins, and he's been there as pastor for quite a number of those 31 years. Um, the theme of the celebration service uh, was, I'm going to read it in Portuguese, a day of the news that you go o senhor, which has the, the meaning of all the time the church has been here until now is only because of the Lord's help. It's an exciting time uh, for our church. We've got a, a lot of young people that have come to know the Lord, some uh, whose parents don't come to church at all. And so that's exciting uh, for us. There are four young men currently working uh, through seminary training, some part-time, some full-time. And then we have one young lady that's gone to Africa, uh, and she will be returning this month, I believe. No, no, next month, from Africa after working in, in orphanages for six months. She took a semester off of university training uh, to, to work in that ministry. So we uh, worship at Igreja Batista da Linda Belia. We also worship at GLCA, which seems kind of strange, but it's not. For a lot of our students, the school is their church. And uh, as teachers, we want to provide an atmosphere that encourages uh, each of the individuals to know the Lord personally, uh, and then to grow in a life of love and devotion, of worship and of service to the Lord. That's the common culture that we share. Uh, here we have uh, a couple of slides of our uh, chapel services. On the right hand side, uh, Miriam Tires, who some of you may have heard of before. She's a Canadian uh, missionary as well with ABWE and serving in Portugal, and she's sharing in elementary chapel. And then on the left hand side, you can see the junior high and high school with our principal there uh, teaching us. And uh, it's uh, interesting to, to see how God is working in our, our student body. Uh, every year we choose a different theme. This year we've chosen Psalm 126, verse 3, which says, The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Now, the elementary students say it much more like that. The high school and junior highs just kind of say it as you call me, because, of course, that's the way we are elementary, or in high school. Well, the three and a half years that we've spent in Portugal were an incredible time of growth in our family's faith. You don't understand um, at the beginning, at least. Uh, but God has been faithful, and uh, He's upheld us uh, through the language and cultural learning. Is this okay? I'm losing that. Okay. <laughs> I can talk really loud, but that would be like me too. But you can always use the as well. Um, okay. Sure. One of our cultural experiences. I did. Okay. Well, I. Sorry about that. So I had left uh, the front gate of uh, our apartment and I was going out to, to the parking lot to get to the car, which driving is another thing, but I won't spend a whole lot of time talking about that. As I'm crossing the street, there's an elderly Portuguese gentleman in the road and he's yelling, I'm the car! I'm the car! And there's nobody else around, so I'm thinking, oh dear, he must be yelling at me. What have I done wrong? <laughs> Cultural stress! <laughs> but uh, it turns out that no, he was not yelling at me. He was calling his dog. On the cot, it's kind of like, heel, come here, come here. And I did have reason to be confused because the dog was not listening in the least. Uh, we've also found out that when you learn a different language, a single letter can make a lot of difference. Uh, we were on a, we were going to a uh, church. Uh, picnic at a camp, and we kept passing uh, all these uh, these signs at the end of the laneway in little stands, and they said uh, uh, Sodaija. Well, the only word that we knew close to that was the word Sodaija, which is the Portuguese word for beer. And so we couldn't really understand why were they selling beer at the end of the laneways at these houses. Well, then we realized, no, Sodaija is spelled with a B, Sodaija, the Vaija. These words said Sodaija. They were selling cherries. And there's a big difference between selling beer at the end of the road and selling <laughs> cherries at the end of the road. Well, in Portugal, we've learned that 10 o'clock means somewhere close to 10.20. 
And we've also learned that when you have a church potluck or you have snacks uh, at church, uh, people like to stand around the table. So when you say excuse me in Portuguese, call me senza, you have to learn how to throw a few elbows to wade through the people to be able to get to the food as well. Uh, we've also, uh, the Lord has provided great growth in our friendships, whether it's with our family members that are our colleagues, uh, also in our church. Uh, you can see Michelle there with a group of ladies in the upper right-hand corner. But then the Lord has also grown our ABWE uh, missionary family. And at the bottom of that photo, you can see uh, all of the missionaries for ABWE in Portugal and in Spain. So it's the Iberian Peninsula team. Well, we've mentioned already the physical growth, especially of uh, Drew and Caleb, and uh, that makes me uh, just pause and uh, want to thank the Lord for the financial provision uh, that uh, he's carried us through our first trip in Portugal, uh, because a good portion of our salary was put toward the grocery bill. Uh, well, we're also excited to see growth in, in God's kingdom uh, through people coming to know the Lord as personal savior. As a, as a teacher, uh, it's a great blessing to see these unchurched uh, students come to know the Lord. And uh, we've got a, a great illustration of that. So, the boy circled in yellow is the Lord. He's an Epilogue student um, that uh, came from a uh, practicing Hindu family. Uh, he was first introduced to the Bible uh, by missionary teachers like us. And uh, in his elementary years, as a young boy, uh, he was taught how to learn, uh, he was taught how to read in English and um, exposed to Bible lessons each day and um, just chapel services and learned uh, many of the Sunday schoolish type songs. Uh, and through those years, he saw um, his need for a personal salvation. As an elementary student, the Lord uh, accepted Christ as his personal Savior and uh, used his school time just to, to grow in the Lord. Uh, we're told the story of uh, his first Christmas celebrating as a Christian. Now, uh, his parents practice um, uh, typical Hindu religion, and uh, their meal was actually offered um, to the gods, and uh, uh, the ancestors were prayed for before the meal was eaten by the family. And uh, the Lord is young boy, he knew that, you know, this Christmas is Jesus' birthday, and the, these two just don't, don't match. And so he took it upon himself that uh, first Christmas as a Christian to buy his own meal. So he got himself a happy meal and went into his room, and uh, his parents had not refused to let him practice Christianity, but uh, he was not to do it openly in the home at all. So his door was shut, and he spent that day with his happy meal. Uh, just praying and uh, reading the Bible that he had and being able to uh, sing the Christmas carols that he had learned. Well, the Lord continued to grow spiritually through his years. He graduated a couple years ago from our school. He's now in um, medical school in the country of Bangladesh. But he still has his contacts in Lisbon in the Nepalese community. And uh, he comes home to Lisbon for the summer, the well, last summer. I uh, brought to the school four new Nepalese girls to help them register at our school. Uh, the Lord helped them through the process and acted as a translator, and he said to our principal, these girls need to be here because here they will know the truth. Well, in the fall months, just like the Lord had done as a little boy, these girls were introduced to the Bible, to the love of Christ, and really to a, a family atmosphere that we have uh, because of Christ's love our school. Uh, well, just before Christmas, Unisha, who's a girl circled in yellow, uh, she made a profession of faith, and her words were, the God of the Bible that I have learned is the only true and living God, and she at that time gave her life to him. Uh, since then, we have had four more high school students saved, and uh, it's just so exciting. So if you would join us uh, and the Lord as we continue to pray. Uh, the other Nepalese girls are Sarah and Vidya and Nisha. And I don't think you need to remember those names. God knows who you're talking about. You just say those Nepalese girls at the school in Portugal. And uh, many of our other international students. Uh, we 
pray that God can continue to grow his kingdom to include their needs. Uh, we also are privileged to be able to serve in Portugal, and we're surrounded by our, as we've mentioned, a number of different uh, missionary colleagues. But then also, we're privileged to have the heritage of the national believers there. Uh, Portuguese brothers and sisters help us as we share uh, God's word with people. Uh, our responsibilities at the school change a lot. Uh, teachers have to be flexible anyway, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or a children's church worker or a classroom teacher like uh, we are. Uh, but uh, each of the years that I've taught has been at either a different level or with a different group of kids, uh, either mostly English or mostly ESL. I've taught third grade and fourth grade and kindergarten, and when I go back in the fall, I'll be the first and second grade teacher. Uh, so there's a lot of change um, uh, and uh, a lot of students coming in and out, but that just opens uh, the doors for more people to be able to reach and to touch uh, and to share with. Uh, as members of our missionary team, we are privileged to serve uh, myself as the assistant to the field team leader, and so we help with kind of the policies and practices of the missionaries working with the nationals, kind of deciding which direction we want to go, uh, what was working, what isn't working, and kind of visiting that. And then also we have uh, working with other colleagues across Western Europe, and that's uh, exciting. Michelle is privileged um, to work uh, in our uh, with our language acquisition and orientation committee. And so when new missionaries come to Portugal, it's her job to help them just get used to living in the country, uh, figuring out what's the best way they learn the language, uh, and being able to, to do those things. Uh, we're also privileged to be able to serve in the community. Uh, I am involved in teaching ESL, English as a Second Language, and then also the boys have been involved in some sports, and so we're starting to see some fruit from those uh, relationships as well. Yeah, that's correct. The longer that we are in Portugal, the more that those relationships will continue to grow. Portuguese people are very curious, and so it, uh, there's a lot of uh, open opportunities when they say, where, you know, where are you from? You're Canadian and you live here? But why? <laughs> well, besides the weather, there is a better reason than that. <laughs> Uh, was she started to come back to the church. 
and uh, praise the Lord, she rededicated her life to the Lord, and uh, this is her speaking at her uh, baptism, and uh, it was, you know, interesting because her uh, partner, Georges, told her, I don't want anything to do with it, if you want to go to church, that's fine, that's your choice, bring the kids, but don't involve me. Well, one day, a few weeks later, uh, Georges and Liliana were in the local uh, grocery store, and they ran into our, our pastor, Pastor Matish, and he started to speak with them, and they chatted for 10 to 15 minutes. And Georges <laughs> said to Liliana afterwards, wow, if Christians care about people so much, I want to know more. And so he started to attend church as well. And uh, he came to uh, know the Lord as a personal Savior. He also was baptized. And then it was just a, a great time of celebration for our congreg uh, congregation. Uh, as the two of them uh, were married in the church and we had a, a ceremony there, we would ask that you pray for the family, uh, Tinoco, George, Liliana, Liliana, Jacques, and, and Serena. Uh, George owns and operates a local cafe and bakery uh, and is constantly telling people about the Lord and about their need to save here and to come to church. And so that's an exciting thing that's going on uh, in our community as well. Well, it's the stories like the Lord's and then George and Liliana's that uh, really excite and motivate us uh, to go back for our second part. We're calling it Round Two. Uh, the Lord's impressed upon our lives that the job's not done, uh, so we'll be going back and trusting him uh, for provision and for the strength. As we know, we'll continue to be stretched and tested, and uh, we're just looking forward to seeing God's uh, continued work in the country of Portugal. Well, then people ask, well, what, what can we do to help? Well, number one, obviously, you can join our team by please praying for us. At the back, uh, we have our display table set up. We have all sorts of prayer cards. Please take one. Uh, we also have a newsletter form that you can fill out. Uh, and so if you could uh, please uh, just write down your email address and we'll be able to put you on the newsletter list and you'll see what's going on there as well. Uh, you can possibly financially give, uh, partner with us in a couple of different ways, either by a monthly donation that is recurring. Uh, and you know, some people say, well, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. You know, even at a five, ten dollars a month, is a great blessing to us uh, and to our family. Or else you could do a one-time gift, uh, which would help us uh, as well. Uh, then, of course, you could, uh, our, one of the things financially we've been excited about is that the Lord has started to make uh, provision for us. Uh, we needed, when we returned home in February, right in the middle of the deep freeze that all of you know and love and miss so very much, uh, we, uh, we came back and we were about $500 short a month. We're now only about $325 short a month. And so we're uh, excited about what the Lord's doing there. But then also, we have all sorts of possibilities of going to Portugal. And some of you might say, well, now why would I want to do that? Well, let me tell you about some of the opportunities. Obviously, you can help us out in camps and different things like that. Uh, there's a, a short-term personnel program that we have where generally retired uh, people uh, come over and we have an apartment for them, we have a car for them to drive, and uh, we just ask that they uh, make their way over to Portugal and then that they volunteer about 20 hours of time during the week. And then you're free uh, to be able to travel to Portugal. We can help you know, uh, give you a tour. Uh, I'm, I'm a history buff, I love history, and so it's pretty exciting to be able to see a medieval castle. And then in the parking lot, when you're going to see the medieval castle, is a Roman aqueduct built by uh, the Romans in 380. You know, to me, that's kind of neat when you can touch a wall and say, 1,700 years ago, some Roman slaves put this rock here. Uh, anyway, uh, so there, but we also have uh, full-time needs for church planning missionaries, uh, ESL, we have a death ministry that's begun a couple of years ago now, all sorts of youth emphasis, and there are even surfing seminars. You know, some of you maybe are still ready to take on some new sport like surfing and are ready to go for that. Uh, we don't know, all right? As Ben has said, um, feel free to talk to us after the service today and uh, pick up one of our new prayer cards. This is what they look like now for a little bit. I've had my hair cut since then. Um, but, uh, we, we welcome your questions and uh, if you want to continue to hear some of our adventures, sign up for our newsletter. This is us now, called the Serve. And thank you very much for your attention.
Well, in, in a few minutes that we have left, I just want to share with you uh, from the, the Word of the Lord. And uh, I'd like to just invite you to take out your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And one of the things that we want to talk about is the marks of a true servant. What does it mean to be a, a servant? Uh, and, you know, we, we hear about that when it's called to serve. I mean, sometimes we have announcements that you can help us out and serve in the church and, you know, do things like that or serve in the community. Um, you know, certain people like to serve in different ways. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the blood donor clinic. Uh, I love giving blood. Now, some people think that's kind of weird, okay? I'm sorry, but I really do enjoy, you know, going out. I'm O negative, so I'm a universal donor. I can give blood to anybody. The hospitals are always happy to see me. The Red Cross is always happy to see me. My wife, on the other hand, is not a fan of needles. All right? So she's not a person that likes to give blood. Uh, I'm, you know, kind of one of those strange people that sits down in the chair, reclines in kind of the bed there, and, you know, they pull out the needle, and, uh, you know, which arm, and, oh, you know, this arm is fine, and uh, do you want to turn away while I put the needle in your arm? No, I, I kind of want to watch. <laughs> oh, okay. You're one of those people. I get that a lot. But anyway, uh, but that's, those are things. So what do, we, what do we mean by serving? Well, we want to talk about Matthew chapter 20. And uh, the first part that we want to talk about is being selfless. Being selfless. And Matthew chapter 20 begins with the parable of the laborers. And uh, this is, of course, uh, Jesus speaking. And he gives us a parable of a landowner who owns a farm. And he hires people to come and work. <clears throat> now, the Jewish day, of course, began in the morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. And that was kind of hour zero, and then they would, you know, kind of go from, from there. And so this uh, Jewish <coughs> landowner, he goes up and he goes to the um, area and he says to the laborers, hey, go to the marketplace, come to my uh, vineyard and, and work. And so he hires them and they say, we're going to work for a denarius a day. And then he goes back at nine in the morning and does the exact same thing. Then he goes back at noon and does the same thing. And then he goes back at 3. And then finally, at 5 o'clock, he does the same thing. Now, the Jewish work day was 12 hours, so 6 to 6. So 5 o'clock, is, there's only an hour of work left in the day. All right? And he hires these people. Well, then at the end, all right, verse 8 is where we're going to pick up the story. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the 11th hour came, the 11th hour is 5 o'clock, all right. Each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. Now, what, what do we call that phrase when something happens that we don't think is just, or we don't think uh, that's right? We say, that's not... There. Very good. I'm a teacher, so I interact with learning. It's great, so I'm glad you're talking to me. That's fantastic. That's not fair. All right? We worked in this sweltering heat all day, and these guys got hired for an hour, and that's it. Well, notice what the landowner says. He says, but he answered and said to them, verse 13, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. It's not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own. Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. And one of the things as Christians, you know, sometimes we are, we are selfish. You know, we, we want things for ourselves. All right? Uh, as a teacher, I hear it all the time from my students. You know, how is knowing about, you know, English is what I teach right now. How is knowing about nouns and subjects going to help me later on in life? All right. How is making me do this homework going to, you know, make me a better person? That's not fair. But then we can even have that in serious times in our lives. Uh, Twelve years ago, in the month of March, uh, I got a phone call from my mom. And my mom said, on the, uh, said you know, it was kind of strange. And, you know, mom, or, you know, what, what's wrong? Because I knew right away there was something going on. And my mom said to me, Dad's gone. Dad's gone. And I knew right away that meant my father had passed away. And she told me the details. He had died in a, 
in a tractor accident on the home farm. I grew up on a dairy farm. The tractor had rolled over and crushed me. You know, and, and after that, um, I, I kind of said to God, you know, God, that's not fair. My dad was in great health. Mom and dad were just making plans to kind of semi-retire, do some different travel, and do different things. Why did you take a moment? Even I would see friends of mine whose parents, whose dads were still alive, that had been sick, that had been dealing with heart issues for 15, 20 years. And I said, God, it's not fair. My dad was in perfect health. Why? He said, no problem did you take him home. And these friends of mine whose dads are older, who have been in and out of the hospital for years and years and years, why did my father have to go home? Why did he have to leave? You know, and, and what's God's response to that? Trust me. I know that's me. And sometimes that's hard, isn't it, to trust God? But we have to learn it's not about you. It's not about us. And God's plans are better than ours. Now, I want to turn, uh, hold your place in the book of Matthew, but I want us to look at Christ's example of humility from Philippians chapter 2. So, you know, if you've got a pen or something like that, just hold your place there in Matthew. But then turn over to the book of Philippians in chapter 2. Not true, but 2. And we want to see Christ's example of humility, and we see it here. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose. And notice verse 3 here. Do nothing from what? Selfishness. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility. But with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves. Why should we have this attitude? Why should we be selfless? And why should we be humble? Because who was it in? Who had it first? Christ Jesus there in verse 5. And then, of course, it goes on and says, you know, Christ made himself of, of nothing. He even humbled himself. Uh, to the death of the cross. If you look over uh, at verse uh, 8, being found in appearance as a man by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. But then notice what happens, verse 9 and 10. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Be selfless because Christ was a perfect example of humility to us. But then also, Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28, we need to be, a uh, mark of a true servant is to serve. Now, sometimes we think, well, don't we have to serve to be a true servant? But I would say, based on this passage, you know what? Being humble is more important than sometimes serving. Alright, and so let's look at Matthew chapter 20, and we have an instruction about ambition. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, We are able. He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and my left, there, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. In hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called to himself and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercised authority over them. Is it, it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your... What? Servant. Be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, you know, we, we read this passage and we really think to ourselves, okay, come on, Mrs. Zebedee, come on, James John. What are you thinking? 
All right, why are you trying to make yourselves number one? But let's be honest. Don't we do that quite often ourselves? All right, don't we do that ourselves? Hey, look what I've done. All right, look at all the things that I've done. All right. Uh, you know, even the disciples, they get mad in this situation. But if we went back and looked at Mark chapter 9, verses 33 and 34, the disciples are all talking at one point in time. And Jesus says to them in, in Mark chapter 9, Hey, what are you guys talking about? And nobody says anything. Everybody kind of looks at their feet and kind of looks at their hands and looks the other way. Well, why? Because the Bible says there in verse 34, they were talking about who was the greatest among them. All right. They're all guilty of that, and so are we. All right. We want to think, hey, why, why aren't I being lifted up and praised? I did all of this work. But once again, we want to go back to see our perfect example, which is Christ. And let's turn to John chapter 13. Hold your place in Matthew, but turn to John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17. And here we probably have one of the greatest examples, not only of humility, but also of service. All right, that you've ever uh, seen. And because in the beginning of John chapter 13, Christ washes his disciples' feet. All right. Now, I don't know about you, um, but uh, I, I enjoy running. It's something I do as a hobby to keep myself in shape so I can eat all that unhealthy food that I enjoy eating so much. Um, but uh, my wife is pretty honest with me, and she just tells me, you know, you're, you have some ugly feet. All right, you know, keep your shoes on, keep your socks on. Nobody wants to see those. They're, they're kind of ugly. Well, you know what? I would dare say that the disciples had some ugly feet, dirty feet. And yet Jesus got down onto his knees with a basin of water and he washed them and he dried them. Why? Well, this is where we're going to read in verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know why, what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you... What? Do them. See, when I grew up, I grew up going to church every Sunday. Sunday morning, we'd get up early, we'd race to the barn, we'd milk the cows, we'd feed the cows, we'd feed the calves, and then we'd rush to church. And I'd sit in the sermon, and I'd listen, and I'd pick some things up, and then we'd go home, but you know what, during that whole week, nothing changed. Because everything I did about learning uh, was all head knowledge. I knew all sorts of facts about the Bible. I knew what Jesus had done. But it never made it any further than that. And then I was told about his crucifixion in detail. And then suddenly it started to sink in. And then I finally gave my life to the Lord and became a Christian. And so my, my point here is, looking at verse 17, you're not blessed if you know them. You're blessed if you do them. See, all of us know the right thing to do. We all love to be talked about, you know, family and fellowship and neighbors and things like that. But when your neighbor is struggling, and you know, you know what, they could use some help, well, do it. When your neighbor, whether it's someone's in the hospital, whether someone has a need, whether, whether their lawn needs to be cut, help them. Be a blessing. Do them. Be the servant that God wants us to be. Let's continue on. Matthew chapter 20. Back to Matthew chapter 20. Oop, point the thing at the right direction. It works better. Not only does a true servant is selfless, he serves, but he also is going to suffer. Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. And as Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he will be raised up. And, and my point is here is pretty simple, all right? 
History shows that Christians will face contempt. History shows that Christians will be persecuted. Now we are pretty blessed in this country, aren't we? Right? When we think of what is happening in different continents around the world to Christianities and the persecution that they are facing, we are pretty blessed. We're not facing a lot there. But I would once again just suggest to you, all right, sometimes we're a little bit nervous and scared about that, aren't we? And I'll put my hand up for that. You know, I've been in a restaurant and, you know, had received my food and I need to pray. And I'm like, well, what are people going to think? And I've now come to the, my point in my life where I'm like, I don't care what they think. Well, I care what my Heavenly Father thinks because that's more important. And we need, we need to be there. One of my favorite stories, John chapter, or Dan, uh, Daniel chapter 3, we don't have the time to, story or time to go to that story, but most of us know it. It's the story, of course, of the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been brought out with all the different leaders. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has set up this huge golden statue. He says, hey, you know, when the music plays, bow down and worship. And these three guys, they say no. So he pulls them in into his inner court. You know, he says to them, okay, you know, because I'm such a nice guy. Now he's mad as all can be. But he says, because I'm such a nice guy and I'm so graceful, I'm going to play the music. If you bow down now, everything's going to be forgiven and you can live. And I love their response. All right. One of them says, our God whom our, uh, uh, we serve is able to deliver us. All right, from the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, even as if you throw us in and we die, we don't care. We will not serve your gods. And of course, he gets really mad. And he throws them in anyways. And of course, God miraculously saves them. And I believe that Jesus was in the fiery furnace with them. All right. And saved them from that. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 3. If you don't know the story, great story. But the point is this. Who gave these men the courage to say these things? God did. You know what? And God will give us the courage as well when we need it. All right. And once again, we want to think about, you know, Christ's example. Well... What greater example do we need of suffering than Matthew chapter 26 and 27, Mark chapter 15, Luke chapters 22 and 23, and John chapters 18 and 19. These, of course, are the chapters of what? Crucifixion. The crucifixion. The pain and agony. As I mentioned earlier, I knew what the Bible said. I knew about the crucifixion, but until someone kind of went down and really explained it to me, all that suffering, all that pain, all that unbelievable anguish, for me, for me, wow, unbelievable. Finally, we need to move to our last point. Selfless serves, suffers, and of course, a true servant has sympathy. All right, a true servant has compassion. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 to 34. And as they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. And two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. And notice verse 34, moved with what? Compassion. That's sympathy. That's love. Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their, uh, their sight and followed him. You know, I love this story just because, you know, these two blind guys, they're told, everybody's telling them, be quiet. All right, in the vernacular, shut up. All right, Jesus is coming. You're not important. And yet Jesus proves that they are important, doesn't he? What do you want me to do for you? Well, please heal us. You can now turn back Matthew chapter 9. You don't need to place your whole, hold your place in chapter 20 anymore. You go back to chapter 9. And we want to look at two passages and we're wrapped up. Verse 10, in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 10. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. 
But go and learn what this means. I desire what? Compassion, mercy, love, sympathy, and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. All right? That's what Christ wants. He doesn't want us to, you know, be busy with busy and serving. He wants us to have compassion. Same chapter, Matthew chapter 9. Now turn to verses 35 to 38. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And seeing the people, he felt compassion. All right, remember, I, I'm a teacher, you're allowed to talk. All right. Why? Because they were dis distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then this is the teaching to his disciples, verses 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And see, this is where we see Christ's example of, of compassion. Jesus says, you know, you know it. Now go out and do it. You know, uh, and, and we want to do that. I, I love this. This is the end here. You know, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Now, Michelle and I are home in Canada for just under six months. We landed on February 16th. We fly out August the 13th. And we're praying that the Lord will bring in the funds and all the doors that we need to be will be able to let us leave at that point. But most likely, we will not be back in Cortland until after our next service, term of service is, is over. There are people in this neighborhood, there are people in this community, there are people that you work with every day that I will never be able to talk to about the Lord. But you can. See, the Lord says, all right, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Will you have the mark of a true servant? Will you be selfless? Will you serve? Will you be willing to suffer? And will you have compassion? Now, sometimes that means having love for other people that other people are like, you know what? We really don't like him. Stay away. Now, God doesn't say you love them if you feel like it. All right? Jesus doesn't say, well, he had compassion on a couple of them. He had compassion on all of them. Why? All right? Because he was a true servant, and we need to follow his example. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your example of being selfless and of serving and of having sympathy. And, and uh, uh, Lord, we just pray um, that you would help all of us, me included, uh, be better servants of you. Help us to love you like we should. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Makes you want to shout to the Lord. You know, we're always intimidated by people, and I am too. So, I, you know, have to kind of keep it quiet. But <laughs> so much good rejoicing to see souls saved. And wow. And the world teaches us to love the lovely. That's what television and idol worship is all about. But God teaches us to love the unlovely. Those that the world says they're not lovable. We need to love everyone because that's who God wants to love and embrace. And so Jesus came to seek the lost. And those that don't think they're lost are the hardest ones to reach. But there are many there who are just aching and hurting for the love of God. So the mission and the harvest field is definitely plentiful. And the workers are few. What is your work?